today. And uh, what we want to do right now is we're going to demonstrate you some of the World War II weapons that we've got here today. Uh, these, most of these weapons, they're all set up to fire blanks, and we're only shooting blanks. We're not shooting live rounds. Uh, just kind of the side note on that, particularly with the automatic weapons, they don't necessarily like blanks. They prefer to shoot live rounds. So we're going to see if they're going to cooperate today and if they'll function correctly. Uh, some some do a little better than others, but we're going to give it a shot and see. We're going to today. What we're going to start out. We're going to start off with some of the U.S. weapons. The first one we're going to talk about is the uh, M1 carbine. Uh, M1 carbine was adopted by the by the U.S. military early in World War II. It was initially adopted as a replacement for the sidearms. What they were trying to do is soldiers, that, because of their job, may not only have been issued a, a pistol as, a, as their sidearm and not a rifle. Uh, they were trying to give them a weapon that had a little more range and a little more power, knockdown power, than the pistol had. The result of that was the M1 carbine. It shoots, a, uh, shoots from a 15 round box magazine and it shoots the 30 caliber carbine round, which is about 110 grain little 30 caliber bullet. Uh, Semi automatic, had an effective range of about 200 yards on a good day uh, with no wind blowing. It did have more range than most of the sidearms had, but the problem was is they realized that it really didn't have any more punch to it than the 45 pistol round had. So, but it's about five pounds, uh, so a fairly light weapon, and we're going to demonstrate to you the M1 carbon. The M1 carbine. Now the next weapon we want to or show you and talk to you about is the M1 rifle, or what most people know as is the M1 Garand. It's the main battle rifle used by the U.S. military during World War II. Officially adopted by the U.S. Army in 1936 to replace the M1903 Springfield rifle, which was bolt action, which was what we used in World War I. But the uh, M1 shoots, shoots the same round, the same 30 caliber round that the M1 or the 03 Springfield shot. But now, instead of shooting eight rounds from an internal magazine, it's now shooting eight rounds from an in, what they call an end block clip. It's basically eight rounds loaded in this little metal clip. The whole, the, uh, the soldier would pull the bolt to the rear, he would load his end block clip into the rifle, which will release the bolt to go forward, chambering the first round. Now, as he pulls the trigger, again, the M1 was a semi-automatic weapon, so it's going to cycle through those eight rounds. As he fires the last one, the bolt will lock to the rear, and the little metal clip will be ejected. He's ready to grab another clip out of his uh, or his uh, cartridge belt, reload, and shoot. The U.S. military, we were the first country to go to a semi-automatic main battle rifle. So it gave us a great advantage over the Ru the Germans with the, uh, the Mausers and the Japanese with the Arasakas. So here we're going to demonstrate to you the M1 rifle. Enough of that, we'll get into the fun stuff now. Next thing we want to talk to you a little bit about is some of the uh, submachine guns that were used in World War II. First thing we're going to talk to you about is the M3 Grief gun. Uh, the Grief one was adopted kind of midway through the war, more or less as a replacement for the Thompson submachine gun, which we'll talk about here in a little bit. But shoots the same round, shoots the same round as the Thompson, which was the 45 ACP or the automatic Colt pistol round. But now it shoots it from a 30 round stick magazine. Uh, the, the interesting thing about the, the grease gun, the reason it was adopted was the Thompson cost the U.S. government fairly, it was about $250 a copy. The British come out with the Sten submachine gun. Well, that cost the British government about $8 a copy. So we're going, hey, we need something a little cheaper. Uh, they wanted to stay with 45, and the result of that was the grease gun. It cost the U.S. government about $18 a copy instead of 250 but it's all stamped metal, fairly simple, one-piece bolt with a fixed firing pin, and a much lower rate of fire. And you'll see as we fire it here in a minute, it's about 450 rounds a minute, which was the rate of fire on the grease gun. So, step up the fence. Here you'll see the M3 grease gun. Oh, <laughs> 
I know, but that's what you get here 24 hours a day. Eight, nine, ten days a week. The next weapon we've got here is the Thompson submachine gun. That was basically, uh, the Thompson was developed right after World War I. A gentleman by the name of Colonel John Thompson, who was a World War I veteran, realized that with trench warfare in World War I, they needed a weapon that was fairly compact, but an automatic weapon that you could use, basically sweep the trenches with. You know, his ideas resulted in the Thompson submachine gun. Now, the original design, the M1928, had a little different... You know, the bolt was a little more, it was a two-piece bolt, a little more complex, but it also would take the drum magazines, which were either a 50 or 100-round drum. By World War II, they kind of simplified the design when the Army adopts it. They go with the M1 or the M1A1 grease gun. The bolt is a one-piece bolt milled out of a solid block of steel. The charging handle goes to the side, but the thing with the, the M1 or the M1 Thompson is that it only uses stick magazines, either a 30-round or a 20-round. The reason for that was the Army didn't like the drum magazines because you had to load it, you had to wind it, it had a, a leaf spring in it, and it was kind of noisy. So if you're on a night patrol, you know, you don't want this this drum clanking around with the am, with the rounds in it. So they would go with, they went with the stick magazines only. Uh, again, shoots the same 45 ACP round that the 1911 pistol shot, the grease gun shot. Huh. But now it's shooting it at about 800 rounds a minute, a much higher rate of fire than the grease gun hit. So now I'm going to demonstrate for you the Thompson submachine gun. Guys, watch out. Here we go, Eric. Alright, the next weapon we want to demonstrate for you is the Browning Automatic Rifle. Again, this was developed, came to, right towards the end of World War II. Uh, in World War I, excuse me, at the end of World War I, in World War I, everybody started looking for a light machine gun. You know, you had the Maxim, you had the Vickers, big heavy machine guns, you put them in place, you weren't going to move them around. What everybody wanted was an automatic weapon that was lightweight. You could get in and out of the trenches with it, travel through no man's land, but still have automatic weapon fire. From the U.S. side, the result of that was the M1918 Browning Automatic Rifle. Of course, it goes through some, a few minor tweaks and changes between the wars. And by World War II, you're up to the M19, M1918A2 bomb. But essentially, it shoots the same 30 caliber, 30 out six rounds that the M1 rifle shoots, that the O3 Springfield shot, that all of our other machine gun shot, except for the 50 cal. But now it's shooting it from a 20 round box magazine. The BAR had two settings on it. You had slow auto and fast auto, 250 rounds a minute and 500 rounds a minute. The interesting thing with the BAR is it's a fairly heavy weapon. It's about 22 pounds. Because of its weight, and we actually have the bipod off of it. They had a bipod that you could put on. Because of its weight, there's very little kick to this rifle at all, even probably less than the M1 has. And it's an extremely accurate weapon at long range. Uh, it's common, you read a lot of stuff, German soldiers, you know, made statements that they hated having to deal with the BARs because it was so accurate. You know, I've talked to some BAR gunners that said, you know, you could fire a three-round burst at 500 yards and keep all three shots inside a baseball. So that's pretty impressive, wow. you know, for that. So we're going to see. This one's kind of finicky. She doesn't like shooting blanks too well. So we're going to see if she'll cooperate. And we'll show you the Browning automatic rifle. Good. What? <laughs> you see, the rate of fire on that was fairly high. You've only got a 20-round box magazine. That's why most BAR gunners said they tried to control that fire to three-round burst. Three rounds, three rounds, three rounds. Keep your accuracy up and slow down your rate of fire. But supposedly the BAR had the same firepower as an 8 man 8 rifleman with M1s. You could lay down the same amount of fire as 8 riflemen with M1s. So, but every infantry squad had a BAR. Okay, the next what we're going to get into is some foreign weapons. Uh, talk to you about first about some foreign uh, submachine guns. We'll start off with the uh, MP40. This was a German submachine gun, uh, fired the 9mm uh, Parabellum or 9mm Luger round, and shot it from a 32 round stick magazine. Uh, had two, two, basically two rear sights to the S, a short range and long range, but you know, you're probably only talking about an effective range out to about maybe 200 meters at that, probably less than that. But uh, 
Most movies you'll see about World War II looks like all the Germans carried those. Well, actually, not really. Most German most German soldiers carried K-98 Mauser rifles, and a few one of them would actually carry these MP40s. A lot of times, it was more of a support weapon, particularly with the MGs. Some of the support crew with the MGs would carry them because it was automatic. You know, a lot of fire real quick if they had to use it to protect the machine gun. So we're going to demonstrate the MP40 here. Which MP, by the way, stands for machine and pistol. Go ahead. You'll notice the rate of fire on that. You'll see it didn't throw the brass nearly as far as the Thompson and the Grease gun. Okay, uh, the next weapon we're going to demonstrate is a foreign weapon, but it was one of our allies, and that was the British Sten submachine gun. Mm. This particular model here is the Sten Mark II, which is one of the earlier versions of the Sten. This particular one here, you actually can take the barrel off of it. The Mark III, which was the later version, the barrel was fixed in place, and you couldn't change the barrel out. But again, it shoots a 9mm Luger round or 9mm Parabellum, but it shoots it from a 32 round stick magazine, right? But you'll notice with this one, the magazine actually comes out the side of the weapon instead of out of the bottom. But like I mentioned earlier, these cost the British government about $8 a copy to make. It's all just stamped metal, essentially. It's pretty simple. So, here we go. The Sten Mark II submachine gun. Okay, the next weapon we're going to talk to you about is an, another foreign weapon, but again, another one of our allies, and that was the Russian DP-28. This was a Russian-like machine gun. This is the first time we've actually done this, so we're hoping this is going to work for us. But uh, it was a, a, light, a light machine gun used by the Russians, officially adopted in 1928. It's still in use you know, during World War II and, and well on afterwards, and you still see a few of them floating around out there. It shoots the 762 by 54 r which was actually a rimmed cartridge, but it shoots it out of this pan magazine that would go on top of the weapon. That magazine would hold 47 rounds, right? 47 rounds. Fairly, uh, fairly good weapon. Fairly effective at long range. Simple weapon. It's not a lot of parts to it, so it was fairly reliable. And we're going to see if this thing will shoot. Parts. This will be uh, pretty loud. <laughs> wow. Yeah. That was the uh, the Soviet or the Russian DP twenty eight light machine. I like that. The last one we're going to demonstrate for you is the German MG42 here. But, uh, Nick. Excuse me. Okay. It's want to get a picture of it. I thought they'd been over there. This is going to be loud. That is awesome. Hey, uh, Chad. All right, during World War II, uh, the Germans were known for a couple of things. They had real good tanks, or at least big, heavy, beefy, beefy tanks. They also made real good machine guns. Uh, the original MG-34 the older machine gun the Russian Germans used, which was developed in 1934, was all milled, solid steel, receiver, the bolt, everything was fairly complex. Shot 8mm Mauser rounds, which was actually 792 millimeters. Uh, shot it at about 800 rounds a minute. Uh, the Germans, trying to speed up production and save a little money, developed a second type of machine gun. And that was the MG42. Came out in 1942. Stamp receiver, uh, change up the uh, bolt barrel mechanism. But the other thing that, well, the MG34 had it was you could change the barrels on it fairly easily. Uh, unlike all of our machine guns, the barrels are threaded on. You actually have to have an armor to change the barrel. The MG34, you basically twist the weapon in half, and the old barrel pulls out, the new one goes in, and you roll it back around. With the MG42, they come up with an even more ingenious system. All you do is, as long as the bolt is locked to the rear, it fires from the open bolt position, you push forward and pull the barrel out. You put another, a cool barrel in, 
basically lock the barrel back in place, and she's ready to fire again. So technically, you didn't have to unload the weapon to change the barrel on this. You could do it with the weapon loaded as it just did. The reason for that was is the rate of fire on this. The MG42, with the mechanism that the Germans used for the bolt barrel combination, it actually generates about 1,200 rounds a minute rate of fire. It's extremely fast. So the MG42 actually comes with three spare barrels. By the book, you were supposed to change the barrel every 300 rounds. We, we talked to a couple of uh, veterans from the German Army that were, one actually was a POW landing He said, yeah, we didn't do that. I mean, we usually went, you know, depending on how heavy the fight was, you may go a thousand yeah, rounds stay back before in. you even worried about changing the barrel. But the assistant gunner had a, a glove that he wore. The barrel needed to be changed. The gunner would stop firing. He would reach up, pull that out to the side. The, the assistant gunner would grab the hot barrel with the glove. The cool barrel goes in, and you're ready to fire. Mr. Metzroth said the, the train crew could change the barrels out in about 10 seconds. So, you know, keep up a pretty constant rate of fire with it. So, we're going to demonstrate here for you the MG42. We're actually firing it off the tripod, which for the Germans was considered a heavy machine gun at that point. They take it off the tripod and fire it from the bipod, it was considered a light machine gun. So here we go, the MP42. Wow. That was about that was a 50-round belt. So that was a 50 rounds? Pretty quick. That was one bit uh, If you have any questions, feel free to catch any of our guys here, they can probably answer them for you. And we'll do another one of these at about two o'clock. Shoot our 37 millimeter out of tank gun. Oh, great! I love this one. Real quick about this. During World War II, they were armed with a Early on, they were armed with a 37 and a 57 millimeter out of tank gun. They realized early, early on in the war that the 37 wasn't very effective in Europe because the German tanks were just too big. You still see them used in the Pacific a lot, but uh, this here is a, a 37 millimeter. Uh, basically, shoots a 37 millimeter armor-piercing round, which is just a solid, stop, solid steel round, and would penetrate fairly decent, uh, fairly decent armor at a fairly close range. But it was effective out to about 1,000, 1,500 yards, not much beyond that, in the hopes of killing anything. But here we go, we're going to fire our 37 millimeters. This is loud. Yeah. Oh, yeah. Yeah. That was That's pretty cool. Did you count that? Yeah. Yeah. That'll get your attention. <laughs> you usually did. He reloads it.